As the Soviet Union put the first man in space in April of 1961, the Americans were already preparing a similar mission. Project Mercury's objective was to launch an American astronaut into orbit and return him safely to Earth. It was an unprecedented event in the history of the U.S. space program. Alan Shepard, a World War II veteran and Navy test pilot, was chosen to lead the first American manned mission into space. On May 5, 1961, Shepard's 15-minute, 22-second suborbital flight aboard the Mercury Redstone 3 was a huge technological success. Not only was it able to assess how the human body withstood high gravitational forces, but it also provided the basis for future NASA programs. Only three weeks after the game-changing feat, President John F. Kennedy would place a challenging goal upon his nation. By the end of the decade, America would land on the moon. Project Mercury. In the late 1950s, there was minimal knowledge on how the human body would react to space. Some scientists even assumed that experiencing zero gravity would lead to cardiovascular failure or that the gravitational force would crush the astronauts. But the desire to win the space race was crucial for the U.S. political agenda. When the Soviets proved their supremacy with the Sputnik 1 launch in 1957, it wasn't about political pressure anymore. It became a matter of national security. In 1958, President Dwight D. Eisenhower created a non-military space agency called NASA with the specific mission of sending the first astronauts to space. Project Astronaut was immediately put into motion. It was later renamed Mercury in relation to classical mythology and the speed it would take to achieve such a deed. Seven astronauts, among hundreds of volunteers, were selected to fly spacecraft for Project Mercury. They were among the fittest engineers, qualified to put both their bodies and minds into an operation that would confront them with the immensity of the vacuum. Beyond attaining a technological edge, the general public regarded these star sailors as heroes fighting communism. On April 12, 1961, American spirits dimmed as the Soviet Vostok-1 completed one orbit around the Earth, with cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin on board. The closest the Americans had gotten to a manned spaceflight was the Mercury Redstone 2, launched in January with a chimpanzee named Ham. The mission had many technical failures and deviated considerably from its predetermined trajectory, missing its splash point by several miles and almost sinking. However, the prowess established the feasibility of human-crewed spaceflight in the near future. After the Mercury Redstone 2, NASA rolled out the Mercury Redstone BD uncrewed booster development flight to adjust several factors before launching a crewed mission. Had NASA been a little bolder, an astronaut could have flown in this operation launched on March 24th prior to the Vostok 1's feet. But security concerns were pressing. The Mercury Redstone 3 would be the next space flight to attempt to put an American into space. But the successful MRBD mission pushed the MR3 back a month to April 25th. Project Mercury's next objective was threefold. First, to achieve an orbital flight around the Earth. Second, to test the human ability to perform in space, including the capability to control the vehicle under extreme conditions of weightlessness and high gravitational push. And third, to safely recover both the pilot and the spacecraft. The Soviet Vostok 1 had fulfilled the first and third objectives. Gagarin had been in orbit for 108 minutes. But in contrast to their competitors, the Soviets narrowed their focus to their fully automated systems, disregarding the human factor. On the other hand, NASA was keenly interested in training highly skilled astronauts. Ultimately, even though the Soviets put a human in space first, the progress made by the Project Mercury program would prove more valuable in the long run. The Mercury 7 Alan Shepard was a World War II veteran who eventually became a naval aviator and then a test pilot. In early 1959, he was chosen as part of the seven astronauts who would be part of Project Mercury. On January 19, 1961, NASA's Space Task Group Director Robert R. Gilruth told the seven astronauts that Shepard had been selected to lead the Mercury Redstone 3 mission. Still, three names were provided to the press on February 22nd, Alan Shepard, John Glenn, and Gus Grissom. All of the astronauts had been allowed to name their capsules. Shepard used the name Freedom 7 and inadvertently established a tradition in which the remaining astronauts would add that number to their spacecraft. This peculiarity would honor the original group, known as the Mercury 7. The seven astronauts had undergone thorough training for two years. From the beginning of the project, the pilots became extensively involved and even contributed ideas to the engineers, technicians, and designers. During the research and development phase, they studied the craft systems closely, parallel to their sessions on astronautics, space mechanics, and space flight. Special attention was placed on the zero-gravity factor, 
given that no American had ever experienced such unnatural conditions. Despite being experienced pilots, they had to practice extensively on manually controlling the three axes of rotation in the simulated vastness of space. As the pilots were being trained, the Marshall Space Flight Center and the McDonald Aircraft Company plant were working hard at reducing the risk element as much as possible. From the components and systems to the prototypes and the production craft, the era of manned ballistic flights was ready to begin. On April 21st, 1961, the Mercury 3 was positioned on Launch Pad 5 at Cape Canaveral in Brevard County, Florida. It then underwent 10 days of simulated launch operations. Simultaneous tests were run on all systems, and the pressure chamber was examined for environmental control. The spacecraft was finally ready to launch. Countdown Starting on May 1st, the pre-launch countdown was split into two days of four and six hours each. Final arrangements included a comprehensive health check on astronaut Alan Shepard, but marginal weather conditions ended up delaying the launch by three days to May 5th. On the day of the launch, Shepard woke up at 1.10 a.m. He had been on a low-residue diet for three days, so he ate steak and eggs with toast, coffee, and orange juice, another tradition he unwittingly initiated. At 2.40 a.m., he left for another thorough physical examination before donning his pressure suit. He then laid down on a couch in the transport van as his spacesuit was filled with oxygen. Meanwhile, fellow astronaut Gordon Cooper briefed him on the operation's status. Shepard climbed to the Freedom 7 capsule at 5.15 a.m. He felt his heartbeat quickening as the hatch closed and the gantry crew chorused, quote, Happy landings, Commander. The astronaut then underwent a denitrogenation procedure by breathing pure oxygen to prevent an aeroembolism. Fifteen minutes before the planned 7.20 a.m. launch, there was a holdup because of a cloud cover. One of the operation's goals was to get quality footage of the Earth, so good weather conditions were necessary. Subsequent holds kept delaying the launch. A minor electrical failure had to be fixed, and Mission Control needed to run a complete computer recheck. Finally, almost two and a half hours after the initially scheduled time, the Mercury 3 lifted off. The launch. The Mercury 3 launched at 9.34 a.m. on May 5th. An estimated 45 million viewers witnessed the event on television. The liftoff was going smoothly for its first 45 seconds. The spacecraft then reached the transonic speed zone, and turbulence built up. Noise levels rose noticeably, too. The commander wasn't able to hear much of the closing countdown except for the firing command. His pulse rate quickly rose to 126 beats per minute. As the vibrations decreased, the spaceship reached an acceleration peak G-load of 6.3. Just before the Redstone engine shut down two minutes and 22 seconds after launch, Shepard said, quote, all systems go. Even though the trajectory was slightly deviated by one degree, the space fixed velocity was 5,134 miles per hour, very close to the planned value. Outside the hull, the temperature was 220 degrees Fahrenheit, but the astronaut rested comfortably at 75 degrees. The escape tower was jettisoned next, and at the three-minute mark, the automated attitude control system turned the capsule around to face its blunt heat shield forward, ready to re-enter the atmosphere. It was now time to complete the most essential task, testing how much control the astronaut had over his spacecraft. Shepard took manual control and positioned the capsule to its planned retrofire attitude of 34 degrees pitch. As he experimented and maneuvered with all three axes, Shepard was satisfied with the response. Shepard was also marveled by the view. He reported distinguishing significant landmasses and coastlines, such as Florida and the Gulf of Mexico, and major bodies of water, such as Lake Okeechobee. Individual cities were harder to recognize. Following the spaceflight schedule, Shepard switched into fly-by-wire mode. He reported that it felt smooth and entirely in command. But after adjusting roll and yaw, Shepard realized that his pitch position was 25 degrees instead of the necessary 35 for re-entry. While correcting the position, the time retro rockets fired, propelling him back into the atmosphere. Landing and Recovery The retro rocket pack was successfully jettisoned without grave consequences. The automatic systems then took over, reorienting the craft for re-entry. This was the only moment that Shepard did not feel on top of the situation. Moderate oscillations emerged as the gravitational stress built up. Shepard kept control until the G-forces peaked, then steadied the craft and finally relinquished control to begin the descent. The re-entry happened faster than anticipated. Shepard worried about the drogue deployment, but they performed without a hitch. The drogue broke the fall at 21,000 feet. The air inlet valve opened to calibrate at the ambient air pressure, and the main parachute spread at 10,000 feet, which the astronaut was, quote, delighted to see. Gliding down at a rate of 35 feet per second, the landing bag dropped, 
and Shepard reported back to Mission Control before plunging below the radio horizon. During the splashdown, the capsule was tilted 60 degrees but slowly corrected its angle. Shepard excitedly announced that he was ready to be recovered. Helicopters from the Marine Air Force Group 26 lifted the craft partly out of the water and the astronaut finally disembarked. Shepard was flown to the USS Lake Champlain along with the capsule. The recovery process took only 11 minutes. The Freedom 7 was intact and could have been reused, but NASA gave it to the Smithsonian Institution. Up to 2012, it was on display at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. It can currently be seen at the Kennedy Library in Boston, Massachusetts. Alan Shepard was in excellent condition, too. Despite concerns from some physiologists who claimed that the journey could have caused disorientation, and psychologists who worried about the space voyager losing his mind, Shepard stated that his five minutes of weightlessness had been, quote, just a pleasant ride. President Kennedy was quick to congratulate the first American astronaut who had ventured into space on behalf of the country. Through a Flagbridge telephone call, he said, quote, well done. <laughs>